would be to apologize and to say that I need to backtrack a little bit. Um, so the, the previous lecture, uh, I, I finished it by uh, start starting to introduce the notion of equality structure. And I need to backtrack on that. So just cross it out. Because um, as it happens, um, I looked at it again. And I, I don't know how to define, uh, how, I don't know what is the right <laughs> definition of equality structure for general C structures. Uh, it, I don't know how to how to define the structure on, on a C structure, which allow uh, taking a quotient which would be surjective. In general, I will introduce an analog of it in the particular case of a special kind of C structures, which will be sufficient for the type theory purposes. But in general, that's that's an open problem. How to define wh what kind of, I mean. It, it will be probably more interesting after I introduce this notion in this uh, special case. And then the, the, the open problem would be to how to generalize that or reformulate it in terms of general C structures and not this particular uh, subclass of C structures. So, um, so today I'm, um, so we, we, we spoke about C structures. We, we know that they can be given by, um, um, two different uh, systems of uh, sorts and, and operations. So they can either be uh, given as a set level category with additional structure, or they can be given in terms of the sequent axiomatics. And um, the theorem which says that they are equivalent is, is a pre-theorem at the moment, because the details haven't been verified. And it's something to be done um, in Coke, I suppose, because there are too many details for um, hands-on verification and I think it, it, it's it, it's not difficult to do it in cork and it's much more difficult to do it by hand um, so uh, today I'm uh, beginning uh, to uh, I, I'm, I, I proceed to, to the key definition to the definition of what a type system is and um, the definition is um, it's kind of several layers of notions which need to be introduced. And the very first one is the notion of system of expressions. So that was, that's the result of my attempt to, to, to give some kind of mathematical anchoring to, uh, to, to the syntactic structures which, uh, which occur all, uh, in, uh, in logic and in type theory. So what we want to do is to somehow formalize um, and then abstract uh, the kind of objects which are formed by, I don't know, let's say, we, for example, uh, untyped lab, or, or, or I don't know, for, for mathematicians here, probably like a predicate logic. So this, these are typically expressions of some form like that, let's say unsorted, um, which may also contain some, so some of the variables inside are usually bound, some of the variables are free. And we start by uh, giving a mathematical description of general structures of this form. So, um, and that can be found in, in notes on type systems uh, under the systems of expressions, um, in the section on system of expressions. So we start by, <coughs> it will be a little technical, um, but I think it's worth doing it um, carefully here once. So, uh, so TM will be the set of, I'll comment on that in a moment, uh, finite rooted planar trees with um, vertices uh, carrying 
labels from the set M. So M is a set, um, set of labels. Uh, now I'm considering trees, planar just means that the edges which leave every vertex are uh, ordered. And then at every vertex, I have a label, including the root. I have the label from, uh, from this from this set. So the collection of all such gadgets does form a set as opposed to something like a groupoid or a category because these things don't have any symmetries. Due to the ordering of the um, edges, these things don't have uh, symmetries. So this is indeed a type of H level two, as we would say. Um, now one considers will be a bunch of notations. So for, uh, for T in Tm, I will write something like V in T to mean that V is a vertex of T. So V in, in square brackets uh, is a subtree generated by a vertex. So M2 in square brackets is this thing. Uh, V1 is, is less than V2 if uh, V1 belongs to V2 and V1 is not equal to V2. Now, if I want to write a, uh, now I want to, to keep this example in mind all the time. So I want to encode this thing as a tree. I, that's actually what, 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 is, what is done, I think, in, in the programming version of it also. But kind of I, I, I was thinking about it, trying to do it mathematically. But turns out that it's the same as how it's done in <coughs> in the computer version, slightly different than in the computer version. Uh, you'll, you'll see in a moment how. Um, so in general, if I have a vertex labeled by M, and the branches from this vertex are B1 and so on, Bn, then I'll write like that, the tree with the root labeled by M and branches B1, Bn. Now, I want to write this thing as follows. So the, the root, or maybe I'll, well, l let me draw and then write. So the root will be labeled by exist, and by, by a pair, exist and y. Underneath, there will be a thing labeled by a pair for all and x. Underneath, there will be, well, we need something like that, presumably. Uh, um, and this will be P, Q, and another Q. Um, now, uh, continuing uh, this example, suppose we had the theory which would be uh, multi-sorted. So suppose the variables could have various sorts. So then I would write uh, there exists y in S1 and for all x in S2. So what do I do then in, in this representation? I just um, put here S1, put here S2. So um, so now one considers something, let's call it all expressions. Um, so one, one first fixes um, 
three sets. So A, which will be eventually the set of free variables, of names of free variables. B, which, which will eventually be the set of names of bound variables. And CON, which which comes from the word constructor, which will be the set of names of, or the set of constructors, so of um, of all kinds of special symbols, in other words. So for three things like that, I write. Uh, all expressions A, B, C, O, N to be the following gadget. It's T, uh, A, B, N greater or equal to zero. So what it says here is that labels can be uh, it can be a label can be either a name of a free variable or a name of a bound variable, or it can be a sequence like here, where the first uh, item is a special symbol, and then there is a list of uh, uh, names of bound variables. So a typical example of a kind of I mean, as a, as a short short speak, one can call those those uh, special symbols which do have variables attached to them. I, I call them quantifiers, just as a general term. And those which don't have variables attached to them, whatever, something else. So a typical example of a quantifier which bounds more than one variable would be, for example, an integral uh, in two variables. So mathematically integral, if one thinks about this, this actually fits all kinds of systems of expressions. And if I write something like that, uh, then x1 and x2 are bound variables in this expression. And, and there is one single quantifier which bounds two variables. Uh, in, in type systems, in this, what, in this more complex ones, which uh, I'm thinking about, there occur um, also quantifiers with, with more than, um, which bound more than one variable. So this is a typical situation in a sense. Uh, now, uh, an expression is called unambiguous. I, I don't know how to spell this word, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if uh, so, yeah. Let, let's also have a notation L of V, the label. On V. So if L of V, I, and finally maybe we we'll also want to have balance C of V, where balance C only counts the uh, outgoing uh, edges. So, so the balance of this is two. Like, so if L of V is in a or B, then its valency is zero. Uh, so anything which is marked by a variable is a leaf. If L of B1 is, uh, let's see, V less than V1. 
it is a bit boring, but it, it will end soon enough. So I, I think it's uh, <laughs> it's good to um, to write it. Um, So that says that if one word it says, it, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm putting rather strong conditions. I'm going to put even stronger conditions in a moment. Uh, uh, one, um, so, so one has to put some conditions which uh, eliminate the conflict of uh, names of bound variables. And here the condition is that if something is bound upstream, the same name cannot be used as a bound variable downstream. Um, so this is just this and um, I think these are all the conditions, but that's again something which would be interesting to uh, to check uh, through formalization because checking it all of this uh, simple things by hand is very So the last condition says that if uh, if a vertex is, is is carries the name of a variable of a bound variable, then it sits underneath the quantifier which bounds the variable. Yes. Yes, in, in that example, yes, the, the P's and Q's are themselves uh, some kind of trees, and, and they can have. Uh, so here we stop already with the X, the Y, and the Z. Those will be the leaves. Those will be the leaves, yeah, right. And then that, there can also be constants which can be leaves. Um, um, now the notion, so the so next thing which I'm leading to is the notion of alpha equivalence. And um, I'll do it as follows. So the first observation is that if we are given some functions a to a prime, b to b prime, and con to con prime, then we get uh, a mapping from all expressions of A, B, C, O, N into all expressions of A prime, B prime, C, O, N prime. And if, let's call it F, B, F, A, F, C, O, N. So if F, B is injective, then uh, then f takes unambiguous to unambiguous I know it's a little weird, but for the purposes of general getting general definition, it, it, it doesn't 
It doesn't matter. Well, after all, even in the case of an integral, one can think that integral can have either one or more uh, bounding variables. But in practice, it's, um, I'll say something about uh, the uh, relation between the well-formed formulas and, and all formulas. So if, if we call these things, I call these things expressions. And um, in general, if one fixes, uh, one fixes a set of special, uh, let, let, let me, wait, let, let, let me continue in the, uh, in this way. Right, so this, I think, was denoted by F low over star, just to, because it's covariant, so it's the mapping. And alpha equivalence is defined as follows. So if I have um, T, T prime in unambiguous expressions over A, B, one are called alpha equivalent if there exist uh, uh, actually excuse me I'll have I'll want it slightly differently T in an ambiguous expression a B C O N and C prime in an ambiguous expression in A, B prime, C, O, N. And I want to, to define alpha equivalence, which can allow me to change the, um, the domains where the uh, names of bound variables live. So if there exist a B2 prime and two functions, uh, And an ambiguous T2 prime over the B2 prime such that F lower star at T2 prime equals F equals F prime lower star of Again, I think it's correct, but uh, I would uh, be happier when it's, uh, when it's formalized. Um, so there is a simple lemma. So it means that we can, so that we can have an expression where the names of uh, bound variables are now from a, from a n new set. Yes. Uh, oh yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm. Uh, it's T and F prime. Yeah. The type checker wouldn't let me write that. <laughs> um. So. Uh, what we know about it is that this is an equivalence relation uh, for every B and T in U A X A B C O N, there exist uh, T prime in U A X A natural numbers C O N such that T prime is alpha equivalent to T. So we can always make the 
uh, bound variables into natural numbers, which we're going to, to do from this point on, roughly speaking. And uh, in addition, uh, let me write here SUA, where uh, an expression is strictly unambiguous if all uh, if uh, LV equals CX1, XN, LV prime equals C prime, X prime, XN prime prime implies X1, XN doesn't intersect X1 prime, XN prime. So if all the names of bound variables are different, not only an, not only a, a longer branch, but even in, in independent branches. Now this thing is is useful uh, in in terms of alpha equivalence because one can prove a lemma. Uh, I mean, which which is the third part of this lemma, but I won't write it. I'll just say it that if uh, an expression is if two expressions are strictly unambiguous and live on the same um, set of names of bound variables, then they're alpha equivalent if and only if they can be obtained from each other by permutation of the names. In general, it doesn't seem to be right, but um, for the strictly unambiguous, the alpha equivalence can be um, realized by these permutations. Uh, it's empty. Um, so, um, so this allows us to make uh, the following notation. Um, the definition uh, X A C O N by definition one takes strictly unambiguous uh, expressions over A natural numbers in CON modulus alpha equivalence. And now we got rid of, of B. So now we have uh, two parameters in our, um, maybe sometimes I'll write alpha here. So now we have two parameters A and CON. And uh, so this is a set. And this set is, uh, in the same way, covariantly functorial in A and CON. So if I have a map from A to A prime or in CON to CON prime, then I have a map between the corresponding uh, sets of alpha equivalence classes. Now, the next uh, structure which, which this gadget possesses is that um, there is substitution. So. Uh, a substitution, I can write it in two different ways. I can write X A C O N times disjoint union over little a's in A X uh, X A C O N maps to um, X disjoint union of A in A, X A C O N. So here I have an expression with three variables from A. Here I have a collection of expressions uh, which have, I mean, I have a, for each uh, variable name I have an expression and I substitute it instead of that variable. So of course I need to do it. Uh, I need to um, to do the renamings of, of the bound variables in the process. But up to alpha equivalence, it's well defined. Yes, this one should be product, right? 
So uh, alternatively, I can write the same thing uh, in a slightly different notation. I can write x alpha x alpha a c o n c o n to x alpha a c o n. Now, uh, what that means is the following. I take an expression whose free variables are the same as themselves expressions. On this, I mean, this j just exactly as, this, as, as it was in this picture, where, where p and q are, were themselves expressions, or I can consider them as variables. And then I kind of open up all the uh, all the parentheses and, and get one long expression. In fact, a, a kind of a mathematician can, can recognize this as something like an, an operad, and this is a, is, a, is a monadic representation of this operad. Um, so, so the important thing is that we have this thing, substitution, It is functorial in A, and it turns, so lemma x alpha, consider as a functor in A, this is, uh, is a monad triple on sets. And that will this. It's not an anocracy in terms of operatic description of Japan gives quite as much structure as the monadic definition. And if we make the operatic definition that um, only describes substitutions that are linear in the variable, then wouldn't we get, say, contextual or something like that? Whereas the monadic is just a smaller subset. This is probably true. What, what one needs to add to. Um, to add, add to this map some kind of maps related to the diagonals in order to, to recover the full picture, yeah. But this is, uh, this I think encodes everything. And, um, and so this is the first, the first layer. So we are, we're going from, from syntax to abstract definition of type system. Uh, now what I'm going to do next, I'm, so this was pure syntax. We started from pure syntax and ended with the monad on sets. Now I'm going to essentially forget about syntax uh, and just think about monads on sets. And so I'll, I'll call, so this monad has a property that it's, uh, I think it's called co-continuous. So it commutes with filtering co-limits. And so uh, I'll be now referring to this monads co-continuous monads on sets as to abstract systems of expressions. Um, and I I'll be defining type system relative to an abstract system of expressions. So in practice, one starts with a system of expressions like that, but the definition doesn't care about, um, about this. It only cares about the monadic structure on, on that thing. <coughs> now here is, uh, let me make another comment, uh, which is related to the following. So when one has only uh, quantifiers which quantify single variables, uh, then there is a classical uh, way of choosing a representative in the alpha equivalence class which is called the, using the De Bruyne indices. Uh, and, um, and that is what is used in implementations of all of these things. Because of course, when one programs, one cannot work with equivalence classes. It's not, uh, it's not particularly uh, convenient. So one, one, one needs to, to make some choice of representative in every uh, alpha equivalence class. 
And for this single uh, variable quantifier, the De Bruyne indices are a very convenient way of doing it. Or maybe now there are more convenient ways, but, but at least it's convenient enough. Uh, but for um, what exactly to do when, uh, when there are multiple variables quantified by one quantifier, I'm not entirely sure. And that is, um, that's one of the things to, to think about in terms of uh, the project for the new proof assistant. Because there, this kind of quantifiers arise. And so the usual De Bruyne indices representation is not going to work. Well, I, I'm not sure how to do it. If, if one has here two variables. <sighs> they are ordered, but um, well, there, there is another issue. So actually, maybe I also want to mention it here. So, so there, there are sort of two ways of doing De Bruyne indices in the case when, when one has only single variable quantifiers. So in, in, in the case when one also has sorts, so let's, let's consider this picture. I may consider this variable y to be either quantified in both, on both branches or only on this branch. And my understanding is that the classical way of doing it is to understand that it's quantified here but not here. So when one counts, one um, um, counts differently in this branch than in that branch, which makes a lot of sense from the type theoretic point of view, but little sense from, from the point of view of formalization. Because if, if, in general, the general quantifier will have like many branches and in in many variables, and the behavior of variables in various branches will be, will be different. And if one starts counting in some branches but not in other branches, then, then it kind of gets messy. Or at least one has to invent some sort of a rule for that. I, and, and I'm not quite sure. Anyway, for me, this is, this is, this is one of the murky, uh, murky places which, which I don't quite know how to deal with. Yet. <laughs> yes, in this particular example, S, uh, y will not occur in S1. Um, but um, yes, there, that, that's in the rules of. of um, so I, I distinguish uh, two two layers here. Uh, one layer is expressions, and expressions are, are this thing. So it's it's, it's fully determined by um, just by the set of, of labels. And this, the second layer is, uh, is what I call terms, where terms are expressions which satisfy some local conditions. So the, the quantifier bound the, the right number of variables. Uh, certain variables don't occur in certain branches and stuff like this. Um, and then everything is actually built out of terms. But again, for the purposes of uh, exposition, mathematical exposition, it's not it's not important. Um, OK, very good. So, <coughs> so we know that any system of expressions, any, any kind of gadget where one uses special symbols and free and bound variables can be, mathematically speaking, reduced to a, to a monad on sets. Um, Now I'm going to start with the monad on sets and, and uh, define a contextual category from it, uh, a C structure. So first of all, if, if one has a monad uh, on any category, there is this notion of a 
it's, it's called by, by a name, which I don't know how to pronounce, uh, the, the category of algebras over the monad. Cl cl <laughs> anyway, so, um, so there are this. Kleisley uh, category? Kleisley, I think, yeah, probably. Uh, w w we'll see, and you, 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 you tell me which one of those it is. One is the category of the algebras, and the other is the category of all algebras. Ah, free algebras. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so we start with. So what we want to do is, is kind of take the, this category of our free algebras over this monad, but not exactly. We want to, uh, we'll do a trick by, so, so the notion of a category of algebras over a monad is, it's, it's a gadget which is defined up to an equivalence. And we will need something which is defined up to an isomorphism. So we'll, uh, and we'll make it into something defined up to an isomorphism in a weird way. So, so I start now with the monad S, co-continuous monad on set. Now let's, now I'm going to define a C structure which will be denoted CC of S. I'm going to describe it in the categorical um, formalism. So I'll first define a set level category and then all the structures on it. Uh, how to describe it directly, it can also be described directly in terms of uh, sequent axiomatics, but, but this way is kind of more familiar. So S is a functor from sets to sets. So S of empty set are, are, are all expressions without free variables. And S of 1 and so on and minus 1 are all expressions whose free variables belong to the set, to the subset of natural numbers. Uh, so I'll take OBCC disjoint union. And one can guess what is the lens, um, the lens structure. Now morphisms, so morphism, um, well, I, I'll write formally. Um, now let's see if I can explain well what it means um, and how the composition is organized. So um, this um, this set is the set of uh, so one takes the free I don't know how to denote it but one takes the free algebra generated by 1n and the free algebra generated by 1m and the functions from one to another uh, is this. It's, it's, uh, it's actually should be in the opposite direction. So um, it, it's, it should be the dual to, to the clients and category. It's algebra, it's algebra maps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Algebra maps are, are given by this set. So now uh, I compose morphisms uh, exactly as, uh, as one composes morphisms in, in this uh, lines and category. So associativity is because of that obvious, because it's a particular case of associativity in, in this uh, category of free algebras. 
Now, what comes out of this, this is a category which is equivalent as, a, as, a, uh, as an H level 3 category, as an H level 3 object. It's equivalent to the category of uh, free S algebras on finite sets, to the, to the opposite category, to, to free uh, S algebras on finite sets. But okay. you want to have that duality in there that you built in right here? Can you flip the variance? Yeah, the, the flipping the variance is important for some reason. I, uh, so the idea, so this is, so in my category, this would be a morphism from uh, an object of lens N to an, ob to an object of lens M, and that would be this. So somewhere there, there is a. Can I, can I ask you? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's that's the key point here uh, because uh, um, that that's a weird way of doing things, but it works very well uh, in practice. So I'm going to. Con I could have started just with natural numbers, and I would get a. a That's, that's kind of another loop in, in the theory which I didn't travel through, so you, you, may, uh, you may enjoy looking at it. I don't know. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so what I'm going to do next is uh, essentially my type systems will be contextual substructures uh, of this gadget. But this will be subcategories on the set level. And they will be very much, uh, I don't know, what, what is it called, Pierre, when, when, um, when one has a subcategory and uh, every object isomorphic to an object in the subcategory belongs to the subcategory. But full, full, full also requires morphisms to be, well, well, it's something like, so, so this will be very much not full subcategories, and in fact, they will also be not not normal subcategories in the sense that there will be isomorphic objects not necessarily uh, belong to the subcategory. Now the equivalence here, let, let's, let's have a look at the equivalence. Equivalence simply maps all objects of lens N into N. And if I have two objects of, of weak wheel lens, uh, then there is an isomorphism between them, which is just given by the identity map here. So any two objects belonging to the same ob n are canonically isomorphic in this category. Um, now there is the issue of um, So let's let's see the the structure of. So the lens function is clear. It's just this n. So now I'm I'm uh, writing the rest of the C structure on this. This is obvious. So the point is is the is the only element of uh, ob zero. So the ob zero here is is an, is a product of, of zero terms, so it's one point. Uh, so the father of C1, Cn is C1, Cn minus 1. So objects are just sequences of, ex of expressions, just now like, like context in, in type <coughs> theory. So this is precisely that. I mean. Uh, if I started with a monad which corresponds to actual system of expressions, then um, this thing would be just random context, kind of a context without any restrictions on, on, on what's written there except for the free variables. And um, 
the canonical, so if I have T1, Tm plus 1, T1, Tm, and here I have R1, Rn, then here I have something which looks as follows, R1, R n here is Tm plus 1, F1 instead of 1, and Fm instead of m. So, um, <coughs> so this is the canonical projection. This is, a this is an arbitrary map, F1 uh, and so on, F1. Uh, M. And that's how one obtains uh, the corresponding um, canonical square, the corresponding um, canonical pullback square. Now, one um, so theorem with this definitions CC of S is a C structure. Everything commutes on the nose. Uh, it's totally um, um, totally legit uh, C structure. And now I'm going to give We're almost there, but not quite. So, uh, <coughs> but now I can give a very simple definition of something which I call a free type system. So a free type system over S is a C substructure of CC of S. Now we can decode this. Because we had this proposition which described um, substructures of a C structure in terms of sequence representation. So let's see what in this case. So in this case, uh, that which I called BN is just OBN. So there are just these sequences of expressions with these uh, restrictions on free variables. Now one can have a look at what is uh, OBN tilde. And uh, Oban tilde, if one looks at the definition of the functions and everything, then one uh, discovers that Bn plus 1 tilde of Cc of S, let's use this notation, is this, yeah, uh, this is S of empty set. Um, Uh, just a second, I think there is, I'm, I'm just, uh, so if one looks at the definition, so what is, there, what is B tilde? It's by definition the sections of the projection from C1, Cn plus 1 to, to from the con sections of the canonical projection. And since morphisms themselves are given by these expressions, the condition that it's a section just means that the first m minus 1 are, um, are identities. And then the last one gives us uh, an extra term here. So in, in the case when S is a system of expressions in the classical sense, what we see here is that the set of contexts is the set of the sequences of expressions. 
the set of this B tilde is just the set of uh, typing judgments. So this is a sequence of expressions T1, T n minus 1, and then some kind of T in T. Uh, probably well, I need either plus 1 here or. Right, I think that's right. So, uh, so we now know also what is our uh, C substructure of such a gadget. C substructure is just a uh, collection of it is just a just a pair of subsets, one subset in here, and another subset in in the union of all of this. So, a C substructure is uh, a subset of permissible context and a subset of permissible typing judgments. And if we write down the, the conditions of this proposition, which what are the conditions on two such subsets to form a C substructure, it comes up to, um, to the very uh, standard um, general properties of, um, of a type system. I don't think I want to write it now, but um, it's essentially the empty, so there are five conditions, and there's the empty context, the fact that the context, if one removes the last term of the context, it's still a context, the fact that if one takes the typing judgment and um, makes a context out of it, then it's a context, so if one removes T and, and places this T here removes the little t and places that t here. Uh, it's the, um, it's a substitution rule. A rule for um, taking a variable as, as a, uh, the rule which says that if that was x1, xn, then, then this is a typing judgment. And, and the rule that, that one can uh, in, insert an extra type in, in the context. Anyway, this, one just reads off this, this conditions of the proposition, which was uh, um, outlined uh, in the first lecture, and one comes up with this um, technical conditions on, on the type system in, in the syntactic form. So this is the definition of a free type system over S. And it is, um, and I think it's reasonably simple and quite general. Uh, so uh, next lecture, I will um, extend this to the definition of a type system, not necessarily free, by uh, introducing something like equality structure in the context of this particular uh, subclass of C structures. So I'll introduce two, two other types of judgments, which are equality between types and equality between objects, and write down the, the collection of axioms on them such that one can use it to uh, take a quotient. So the so general type system will be a sub-quotient, uh, sub essentially, of, you know, of such a thing. Uh, the notion of well-formed is, is contained in, 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 su in the sub part of it. So uh, type system, let's say free type system. A free type system, it, it's a subset in context and subset in judgment. And I, I'm not thinking about individual expressions in these subsets. Like I, I'm just interested in subsets themselves. In practice, the notion of well-formed is also context-dependent in, in in more or less in, in complex systems. So well-formed just means that a well-formed context is the context which belongs to the corresponding subset.
other than through be killed and uh, other through in the context and Yeah, it, it's equivalent to saying that it's a set level subcategory which is closed under all the operations. That, that was the proposition that, um, that this uh, substructures in, in this sense are the same as uh, this pairs of subsets satisfying certain conditions. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and then l l let me say two more words, maybe. Uh, then there will be semantics. Uh, and this, the idea of semantics is that we'll, we'll start with a category of H level 3 and do a certain trick to it. So here we started with syntax and got a C structure. There we'll start with a category up to an equivalence, not up to an isomorphism, and do another trick and also recover a C structure. And then the semantics of a, of a given type system in a given category will be just a homomorphism uh, between these C structures. That's the, that's the idea of kind of tying everything together from syntax to, um, to category. That's not how it works here. No, it doesn't work here at all like that. It's, uh, I mean, and on the level of definitions, it doesn't work like that. On the level of verifying working with a particular system, it doesn't work like that either. It, it works the way it's written in uh, Thomas Stryker book. Uh, I don't quite remember what, how he does it. Um, this notion doesn't appear in the definitions. Okay. It may appear in, uh, in the actual proof for a given type system. Yes. Yes. Are you hoping to recover the theory of the algebraic theory, equation theory proof, as an instance of the type theory? Because certainly you could make the context, they wouldn't be dependent anymore. The context would be. I have no idea, actually. <coughs> I, don't, I, I, I have no idea. But yes, but here most of the flexibility comes from uh, from um, fixing everything at set level, and then taking set level subcategories, which are not closed under isomorphism. So we don't have any we don't have any meaning as on on H level three at all, and that's what that's why we had to kind of blow up this this category, introduce a lot of extra objects to have this um, framework in which we can take now many many subcategories and. That's why I was so insistent on keeping everything on H level two, because that's precisely the place where it would not work at all uh, if it were H level three. No, but if you take natural, ob uh, natural numbers as objects, there will not be enough objects to, to generate all the necessary subcategories. 
because the, 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 uh, when one takes a category and one takes in it a subcategory on the set level, the set of isomorphism classes of this subcategory can be much, much larger than the set of isomorphism classes of the original category. And that's precisely what happens here. The sets of isomorphism classes of the ambient category is just natural numbers. But the set of isomorphism classes of these type systems can be as complicated as one wants. And, and what one makes use of this, of this uh, unnatural but, but very workable procedure. 